All right, y'all. Let's wrap this shit up. Uh, this has been an, a busy, fun-filled, action-packed, hopefully very informative lesson about Nietzsche's madman and Plato's allegory of the cave. So let's just kind of try and wrap all this stuff up and pull everything together and see how it fits into the course, what we've done so far. As you've become accustomed to, we've done a phenomenological analysis of this idea of madman. I mean, not exactly right, but if I'm going to put something in the center, I'm going to put the madman in the center. We start out with the Beatles, Fool on the Hill. Fool on the Hill, this sort of enlightened individual who stands up on the hill. And the fool is on the hill. He sees the sun going down, and the eyes in his head see the world spinning round. Then we move backwards through time to Nietzsche's The Madman from The Gay Science, which was written and published in 1882, one of Friedrich Nietzsche's most important, most influential, most seminal works in many ways, and this parable no less than any other. Then we went to uh, Diogenes of Senape. So Diogenes of Senape was another student of Socrates and really took Socrates' teachings very seriously maybe to a kind of an extreme, and certainly represents a different facet of this madman. And as we saw, Diogenes always carried around a lantern, carried around a lantern in the bright morning hours, and would shove it in people's face and say, I seek an honest person. I seek an honest person. Also, as I mentioned, Diogenes was kind of, he performed a certain kind of madness, which really emphasized this animalistic aspect of what it means to be human. Humans are animals and he kind of viewed all of this all of these cultural adaptations these cultural norms these cultural um as we saw the Yajanese performs this kind of madness where he really emphasizes through his actions behaviors and words that humans are animals we're animals just like any other kind of animals and he kind of mocks all these social conventions all these social constructions these cultural constructions which are artifacts just in the same way that a lantern is an artifact, which is something manufactured or produced or made. It's an artifact created by a human hand, something made. Likewise, so are our cultural conventions, our laws, our customs, our habits, our tendencies, everything that we in society say, this is what it means to be civilized. It's all just made up. It's all just artificial. So Diogenes is sort of flaunting that and emphasizing that we are just animals and we've created this society, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, although Diogenes doesn't seem to love it. But Diogenes wants to emphasize that, you know, we could we could make society in a different way. We we're just he's mocking the fact that we've made all of these things, not because it's bad to make them or produce them, but just to emphasize that these are artificial things, these are artifacts, human artifacts, things that we've constructed. So we have there a distinction between the natural and the artificial, which echoes back to what Socrates taught in the Allegory of the Cave. So in Plato's Republic, book seven, Socrates and Glaucon are in this conversation, and Socrates says, you know, let's look at the effect of education and the lack of education on, you know, a human person. How does this affect our human nature? What is the role of education within a functioning republic, where no one is oppressed, where no one is subjugated, but all have this opportunity to flourish and become themselves as they are. We also, in the, in the allegory of the cave, we as we saw, we have a sharp distinction between what is natural, and in Socrates' terms, the really real, those things that are unchanging and eternal, versus the things that are just purely artificial, purely fleeting. So for him, nothing could be more fleeting than the shadows on the wall cast by artifacts, cast by an artificial fire. So a fire that's made by humans, which then casts shadows of human-made artifacts upon a wall in order to keep people oppressed, in order to keep people in a certain kind of bondage, mostly through distraction, right? And I compared that to social media or movies or any kind of media today, this sort of bombardment of images that keep us distracted so that we don't focus on other things, which can be a form of, of control, control particularly by the wealthy and the powerful who use these systems of distraction in order to keep people from seeing the truth, in order to keep people in their place and keep people bound, more or less, 
in their own ignorance. And we also see that parallel then between the natural, the sun, which is in the sky, which for Socrates represents the ultimate truth, the ultimate, the pinnacle of reality, that what is really real. And he doesn't really mean the sun per se, but instead what the sun represents is truth, goodness, the really real, the forms, the ideas, which for Socrates are eternal. But these are these are juxtaposed to um, those things that are artificial, that are just images and shadows and representations of those higher forms. And he draws our attention directly to justice, saying that, you know, those who are in the cave, they have no experience of justice. They don't know what justice is. They don't know that they're victims of injustice. Instead, the only the person who is liberated from the cave and has has been led out, that educare, has been led out of the cave to see the truth, to see the light on the surface. Only they have had the opportunity to open their eyes and have their eyes adjust to reality as it is. But Socrates emphasizes that it's our responsibility to then go back down into the cave in order to share this news, in order to educate, in order to lead others out, because we can only get out of the cave together. So within the allegory of the cave, we have these sharp contrasts between the darkness in the cave and the light that's out of the cave, the shadows that are cast upon the wall versus the truth that is represented by uh, the sun, the ignorance which holds people in bondage and that relationship between ignorance and bondage, the way that knowledge and justice and truth are withheld from some folks in order to keep them in their position, in order to keep them in a particular kind of bondage so that they can be useful to those who are in positions of power. So we have this juxtaposition also there between bondage and liberation and a direct parallel between ignorance and bondage and freedom, liberation, and truth or knowledge. Last point on Socrates is that he discusses two different kinds of madness. Madness, he always points out, madness has something to do, madness isn't a state of mind, madness is a cultural relationship. So People consider me mad, and I consider other people mad. But who is really mad and who is really not mad? Well, that, says Socrates, we can't really know at the time. He says that, you know, when somebody is emerging from the cave, they're experiencing a kind of blindness, and they think that everyone else is mad. They don't know, like, what other people are saying. Like, remember the prisoners in the cave, when the person comes down to liberate them, they think that person is mad and insane. And Socrates says, you know, if this, if they were to get a hold of him, they would probably kill them for talking all this crazy stuff and trying to interrupt the status quo and disrupt the world as they know it. But Socrates talks about another kind of blindness, the kind of blindness that occurs when someone enters the cave for the second time, after they leave the surface, having seen the truth of justice, having seen the light of the sun, having seen the reality as it is, having seen what the real world is like, then they go back into the cave in order to liberate those people, but they are plagued by a different kind of blindness, a blindness that comes from their eyes trying to readjust to this world of shadows and images and artificial shit, right? That they can lead other people to also think they're they're mad, right? From Socrates' perspective, most of us are not deep in the cave. We're not still prisoners that are bound. And we're also not philosophers who are outside of the cave that have been liberated and seen the truth and have nothing left to learn. But most of us are somewhere in that in-between stage. So in other words, we're all plagued by a certain kind of blindness. And we don't know whether that blindness or that madness is a result of having come out from the truth and having seen the truth and now entering into the darkness and the ignorance again, the world of shadows and the world of darkness? Or is it a madness that comes from that first trek out of the darkness, the first time when you, like Neo, right, coming out of the matrix and why do your eyes hurt because you've never used them before? Because his eyes hurt because he's still learning how to see the truth. And that both of these kind of things can lead to a certain kind of madness or can be perceived by others as a certain kind of madness. And Socrates' point is that, you know, the only way you can really know if somebody's telling you the truth or if they just think they're telling you the truth or if they're telling you something total bullshit is to, first of all, listen to them. Listening doesn't mean that, that, that you believe everything they say. Listening means just listening, right? That everybody needs to be part of that discourse. And Socrates believed that Philosophy and theology can only be done in discourse. That's why the philosophy and theology in this 
religious quest can only happen like, in your podcast and in our discussions with one another. Everything else is just preparation for those moments. So Nietzsche is madman. Layers and layers and layers of meaning. We've only begun to scratch the surface, like Diogenes and Socrates and that kind of stuff. But let's see. You know what? Let's just think about the characters that are in this story. It's a story of sorts, right? It's a, it's a parable or an allegory in the same way that the cave is an allegory. And just in, as the cave has certain characters in that myth, likewise, the allegory of the madman by Nietzsche also has certain characters in it. Primarily three. Obviously, there's the madman, and he says things like, we have killed God. We don't understand what we've done. And he ends by saying, I've come too early. My time is not yet. In other words, the people perceive him as mad, and he knows it, and there's not really anything he can do. It's like, you know, when you're going down into the cave to try and liberate those who are bound, you know, what can you do if you've come too early? But also note, when he says, you know, we have killed him, he emphasizes not so much the God is dead, so much as the we have killed him. What is the, we don't even understand the greatness of this great act that we seem to have performed. How could we do something so huge, right? Great doesn't mean good. Great means big, huge. Then second group of characters are the atheists, right? The people who don't believe in God, the people who are laughing at him, the people who perceive him to be the madman. They're laughing at him. They're mocking him. And then after he goes on his little tirade, they just get confused, right? They're not even, they kind of stop laughing and stop mocking. And they're just like, this dude's crazy. And then they just kind of disappear off of the scene. Then the last group of characters we see in the story are the, are the churches, right? Where the madman at the end of the story goes into the churches day after day. And he enters these churches and he, he sings the Requiem Eternum Deo, the funeral march of the eternal God. So it's a play on the Latin words because it's the, the funeral for the eternal God. There's lots of Christian imagery in there and Christianity. Christians celebrate the empty tomb. So the idea is that the churches are empty tombs and the whole point of discipleship, of being a follower of Christ, is not to go to church, but to go out of the church and to go into the communities and to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, to do those kind of things. In other words, ethics, right? So he's mocking, he's criticizing those churches and saying, you know, y'all are just sort of celebrating the death of God. You're in these tombs and sepulchers, you know, sort of rejoicing over the death of Jesus rather than embodying that or being disciples of Christ, which always leads to that kind of death, standing up for others, going down into the cave in order to liberate others. All right, so that's a perfect segue to take us to the last point which is going back to some of the questions that we've asked at the beginning of this course. Mainly, what is the function of religion? Right? When the section on what is religion, I emphasize that we did an ontology of the word is, right? What is fundamental ontology? What are the different ways that we can use the word is, such as representing form or function or quality. And we said that, you know, in this course, we're going to emphasize on the function of religion. What does religion do for people? What is the impact that religious practices, religious beliefs, religious scriptures, religious doctrines, religious rituals, all of these things, what impact do these have on, what impact do these have on human persons? Nietzsche's madman is trying to get us to ask that question. What is the function of God? What is the function of religion from a, a philosophical and an ethical perspective? Uh, I think he's interested in both of those things from a philosophical, epistemological sense, and but also from an ethical perspective. I mean, those, those things can't be separated very well anyway. But in other words, he is disturbed both by the atheists and by the churches. He's disturbed both by the religious people and the non-religious people. He seems to understand something that they don't. He seems to understand that he seems to understand that religion and divinity have a particular function within our artificial creation of culture, society, ethics, philosophy, epistemology, ways of thinking. These are all things that we've created, that we've made up, just like a lantern. They're artificial. That doesn't make them bad. That doesn't make them good. It just makes them artificial, right? And if it's artificial, if it's man-made, then it can be changed, right? Nature is immutable. Nature is what it is. But if it's artificial, but something that we've crafted, well, when we can recreate it, we can remake it, we can start over. 
But in order to start over, we must question, all right, here's all these things, these elements of religion, these elements of culture. What, uh, what function do they play in how humans understand themselves? And from Nietzsche's perspective, even more important is how do these things influence the decisions that people make ethically? How do doctrines of God, how do they influence how people live their lives? And Nietzsche is criticizing the atheists for saying that they just don't even, they're not even aware of the question, right? They don't even know what they don't know. They don't even, um, they're laughing and mocking him and calling him a madman when really it's they who don't even understand, they don't even understand the function or the role played by God within philosophy and also within society and ethics. But he's also criticizing the churches and their religious folks. From his perspective, these churches and religious communities have lost that ethical sense, and they're focused instead on some sort of self-aggrandizement, some sort of self-reward. They're more interested in afterlife or heaven or prayers being answered or getting what they want. It's sort of like a, a system of exchange. It's become capitalistic. It's become no different from non-religious things. The sacred and the profane have been mashed together so that, you know, if you want to buy milk, you go to the store. If you want to go to heaven, then you go to church. And if you want to buy milk, you pay the milkman. If you want to go to heaven, you pay the priest, right? So he's mocking all of these kind of things in this sort of playful Dionysian way, but it also is a way to say, you know, we've got to, we've got to recreate these things by understanding first their function within the lives of human persons. And only once we understand that function, can we then try to think about what other ways can we artifice or can we create, can we make uh, systems of ethics, systems of society, systems of culture. In other words, as Socrates said, to create a republic where people are in service to one another, where people have a responsibility to one another, where people live up to those responsibilities and respect their neighbor and love their neighbor and are sort of in this together. In other words, we can only get out of the cave together. All right, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you absorbed all of it. I assume that you have lots of questions and I'm eager to answer them, I'm eager to hear them. I'm really eager to hear your conversations, your discussions, your, your continuation of this phenomenological study and analysis so that we might really ask and get our fingers into those questions such as what is the function of religion and divinity within the lives of our neighbors, within the lives of ourselves, within the society in which we live? What sort of function does that perform? What's the relationship between religion, culture, and other artificial things versus ethics and how people live their lives? So that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you took away a lot from it. There's a lot of themes contained in this, um, in this lesson that we'll keep coming back to that we'll kind of weave in and out on this philosophical quest that we're still even just beginning. And I look forward to seeing you all very soon. Namaste.